Welcome to the Something in the Wilderness podcast. My name's Steve, and in each episode of the show, we select an Andrew McMahon song to discuss. Today, I'm excited to welcome Jake to the show to talk with me about some of Andrew's earliest work to ever be discussed here on the show. There are plenty of songs in the catalog we don't hear nearly as much about, so I thought it was a good time to go back to when Andrew was still a teenager, take a trip back to those early days. Jake, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's uh, it's great to be here. I've been waiting for a podcast like this for a while. Yeah, I would go to the podcast app and type in Andrew McMahon, and I, you know, every now and then there's like a cool interview, but I, I was just thinking, man, there needs to be a podcast for him. Yeah, I appreciate the compliment. I, I really just wanted a podcast that would select a song and talk about each each individual song. So that's that's where I come from with this. So I'm really glad to hear that someone like you is out there listening and, and enjoying that. When did you first become an Andrew McMahon fan? So I was a little late to the game. If This was in the Jax era, like 2005. Mm-hmm. I had heard Dark Blue uh, on the radio and things, and I liked it. Mm-hmm. And my my older brother, he actually uh, had the album. I got a lot of my music from my older brothers. Yeah, I'm I'm 30, but I feel like pop culturally speaking and entertainment wise, I was always like five years older than I really am, because I had older siblings. Yeah, which is interesting because Andrew McMahon has said something similar about his upbringing. But anyways, the song that really got me hooked isn't the one we're talking about <laughs> today, but uh-huh. Bruised. Uh huh is the first song where I was like, okay, I really like this. Okay, cool. And then it was Miss Delaney on on Everything in Transit, obviously, is the album I'm talking about. Yeah. And then it was just, well, shoot, I like Last Straw a lot, too. And and then next thing you know, I was like, this whole album is gold. (laughs) Yeah. It was one of the first albums like that for me because there was always – one or two songs on an album that I really liked, and the rest were okay. So it was, it was a perfect album for you? All-time top five. And then I found out that he was in another band, and he was the guy that sang Woke Up in a Car. Mm-hmm. Another great one. Yeah, and so I was like, oh, he's that guy? And that kind of blew my mind. And then I went down like this rabbit hole on YouTube, and I discovered the Live at Ventura show. Oh, yeah. And that is when I really became a fan. Yeah, so you've never seen something corporate in concert then? At- no, I, I wish. Uh, I wasn't able to um, go to the 2010 reunion tour. Yeah, no, unfortunately. I've only seen them twice. Uh, one with Jack's Mannequin and one solo that was okay. pre-Wilderness solo. Oh, all right, like 2013? Around there. Oh, very cool. Have you ever heard of concertarchives.org? No, I haven't. It's a it's a website where you can enter all of your concerts that you've ever been to, and it informs me on the anniversary of the day of the concert. So today, I just got a notification that exactly 16 years ago, I saw something corporate on their North Tour. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 16 years ago today, January 2005. So I such a weird coincidence when we're getting, you know, we're about to get together and record this and I get an email saying, you saw something corporate in Pontiac, Michigan at Clutch Cargos with Straylight Run and Hawthorne Heights 16 years ago. Fascinating. So, thought that was pretty neat. I just missed something corporate. I showed up like right after that was over, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So you said 2005. That's, that's the year I saw him, which is crazy to me because it was only seven months later summer 2005 so i probably really didn't get into it until like what i just described was probably more 2006 okay yeah awesome so yeah because you said you heard bruised so that would have been like maybe uh, maybe on the radio or uh maybe you heard it in snakes on a plane with samuel jackson you know (laughs) i think it was on, on that soundtrack on my blue ipod nano i had i didn't have that whole soundtrack but for whatever reason i had that album art the snakes on a plane i don't know why i had that album art because i didn't listen to the rest of that soundtrack i was already a jack's mannequin fan <laughs> yeah i have i still have the blue ipad ipod nano that i used to listen to that record on constantly and it's all scratched up and it's one of my most prized possessions i've still got the classic it doesn't work right now i don't know if it ever will again but it was working up until like a year ago yeah yeah mine super doesn't work anymore <laughs> yeah all right, so um, I remember when I first heard something corporate at Warp Tour in 2002, I went home and I just tried to get my hands on every track that I could. I was using a couple different sites to download MP3s back then. It was it was post-Napster days, but I don't know if you've ever heard of these things, but Kazaa, Morpheus, Audio Galaxy, 
those were some of the programs we were using to, you know, get a hold of music at the time. And I, at the time, I thought Something Corporate only had one album total, knew about Leaving Through the Window, but I was coming across these random tracks in my downloads that I couldn't place anywhere. You know, this was 18 years ago, so it was a little harder to come by information back then about a band. But songs like Ben Franklin's Kite, Wait, Spin, and this nice piano ballad called Walking By. So alongside songs like Hurricane and Fall, and it was one of the first songs I heard by the band, and I was kind of blown away by how diverse they were. You know, you had these pop punk songs next to these piano ballads. So I thought that was that was pretty neat, but I was all in for, for either one. So the band, of course, is something corporate we've mentioned. And um, the first time this song was released was on the Audio Boxer EP. It was the final track, track six. It was released on October 2nd, 2001. It was actually Something Corporate's first official release since their Ready Break album was self-released the year before. And this song is unique because it's been featured on three different Something Corporate releases. It was on the Songs for Silent Movies EP, which is a Japanese import of rare songs, alternate versions, and a couple of music videos. And most recently, it was on their Greatest Hits collection, Played in Space, in 2010. How did you first come across this song? Do you remember? Yes, I do. Uh, I came across this song through that Live at Ventura show, through watching that DVD. I say DVD, but I watched it on YouTube. But yeah, that's how right. I discovered this song. And I've always loved, I've always loved ballads. I've always loved slow, emotional songs. And even though a lot of people my age just liked fast stuff and were like, "Oh, that sounds so sad," I'm like. It's making me happy. I know it sounds sad, <laughs> but no, yeah, I that bit, live at Ventura show really made me like that that song. Yeah, I can definitely relate to what you said about you know ballads or sad songs, if you will. Um, I feel the same way. I've usually been a fan of the ballads, like of pop punk groups. You know, they always have their ballads, right. and I usually really enjoy those. And and something corporate has several, as we know. So they they waver between that that hard punk sound, like punk rock princess and space all the way to the other end, like with things like Globes and Maps and Constantine and Walking By, which we're talking about today. I was just going to say, a lot of the, the bands, uh, the, the rock bands of this era, didn't really have the range of that. Like that that sort of almost classic rock thing where you have like the, your ballad on the record, and then you have your maybe a little bit more silly song. You have your, your main like single rock song, your main hit, and just kind of the whole package, you know, opposed to just yeah like um, a straight-up pop punk record, which is totally cool too. But to, to have that like uh -huh. almost kind of old-school kind of range really got my attention. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciated that too. So the song was written by Andrew and produced, engineered, and mixed by Jim Wirt. It was recorded at 4th Street Studios. And playing on the song, we have Andrew on piano and vocals, of course, Kevin Clutch Page on bass, Brian Ireland on drums, and then we have some additional players. Charlie Beishart and Peter Kent play the violins, Darren McCann plays the viola, and Steve Richards plays the cello. The string arrangement was done by Christopher Brady. And as far as I know, there's no guitar on this song, is there? I mean, besides the bass. Yeah, you know, now that you, I've never thought about that, but now that you mention it, I, 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 that might be true. In fact, it was the Live of the Ventura that I went back and watched to make me realize that there's a bass guitar on it because Kevin Page is playing bass during the song. And when I went back uh, and listened to the song, the album version again, I was like, yeah, there is a bass in there, but I can't find any guitar. And then I also found this other live video online uh, that I'll mention again later um, when we talk about different versions, but that also just had the drummer, the bassist, and Andrew playing didn't have the two guitarists in it. So that's what kind of led me to believe. I don't think there's any guitar on it anywhere. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's yeah. cool how um, you know it works on multiple levels. Because live, he doesn't have the strings with him. And so it just right. kind of falls back to the piano. And it's just this really stripped down version of his songs with him and the piano that really works on a basic level. Yeah. I was looking at Setlist FM and the song's been played 36 times. According to Setlist FM, anyway, and less than half of them were actually performed by the Something Corporate lineup. But I'm pretty sure that list is incomplete because a lot I noticed a lot of Something Corporate's early tour days aren't on Setlist FM. But you're right, there wouldn't be any strings on any Something Corporate tour. So there's a couple of songs I've now noticed that have strings on them that I guess they just couldn't play the full ver version of in concert. But according to the Live at the Ventura DVD, they just played it with the, the piano and a little bit of drums and bass. 
on Setlist FM, I found that he was playing it just over a year ago on the Winter in the Wilderness Tour. And that would have been a great time to see Andrew, in my opinion, because he was playing Walking By at almost every show. He was playing Lights and Buzz, Cavanaugh Park, She Paints Me Blue. So like a lot of those classic early something corporate songs and, and a little bit of Jack's Mannequin in there too. So when you said you've seen Andrew twice, have you seen the song perform live then? I have not seen this song performed live. No, neither have I. When I saw Jack's Mannequin February 2010, he didn't play any something corporate songs, which I would have loved, but I I wasn't complaining. It was an amazing show. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, side note, that was the Sing For Your Supper tour with Vedera and a very young fun. Oh, wow. Okay. They they had just kind of started. Yeah. But yeah, and then so when, later in 2013, he he played two something corporate songs, Ruthless, which is another one of my all time favorites. Yeah, that's a great and song. And Constantine. Wow, he actually played Constantine. Huh? Yeah. That's that's pretty rare. Right. And uh, I and I love Constantine, and that was like a bucket list thing. But like I always, you know, leading up to this, whenever I would read YouTube comments or like watch footage of live shows and people would yell out Constantine when he didn't want to play it. And I, that's when uh-huh. I kind of started to realize like this song walking by is kind of underrated. Cause I was like, well, Hey, I mean, there's another really good slow kind of song that's romantic and nostalgic. That's like just as good. Only it's not like 11 minutes long. Yeah. You know, I agree with you and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that it doesn't get the attention that Constantine gets. You're, Wow, I never thought of it that way. And then, you know, Constantine kind of got this novelty because he didn't want to play it and because it was so long. Yeah. Which is, if you ever do an episode about that song, I'll I'll be fascinated with that. Yeah. That'll be fun. So this song, Walking By, was uh, most recently played on Andrew's April 1st, 2020 Instagram Live event, and he called it the B-Side Bonanza. Did you catch that one? I did, yes. By the way, those are great. You know, it was such a weird time. The pandemic was very new. And then he put on these free, a lot of people didn't do this, the, these like free, just yeah. like intimate, like hour long chats slash concerts. So it would just be like this intimate group of like 200 to 300 people just yeah. talking with Andrew. And um, I think I've even gotten him to answer some of my questions on some of those, but it was great. Oh, that's so cool. It was a chance to feel connected to an artist we really enjoy in a time when connection was so rare. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of a treat when you're you're such a diehard fan of somebody who's a little bit more under the radar. Mm-hmm. I was trying to explain this to my dad, who's fans with of, you know, so many classic rock. He's seen like Paul McCartney in concert and, and all these uh-huh. amazing bands. And I was trying to explain to him like how when I saw Andrew McMahon in 2013 at this really tiny room in uh, Salt Lake City called In the Venue, I was like, this place was so small, Dad. I was right there, you know. Yeah. It's such a treat to be able to have an intimate setting like that. Um, and I've heard of bands like U2 having like a, a secret show where it's that size and like people are just blown away because it's so rare to get that with somebody as famous as them. Oh, what I was going to say is um, Andrew got a little bit of flack for that B-side Bonanza title because most of the songs he played weren't even B-sides. I mean, I, I guess if you want to put a label on it, maybe maybe he could have called it Deep Cuts. But it was I just remember that being kind of funny. People are like, B-sides? He played I Woke Up in a Car. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of just like, you know what, Andrew, just play whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> I kept track of which songs he played in those. And and now I'll, I'll still like see songs on my list, but I'm like he never played that one, so I'm still hoping he's gonna like come back and play the other like 25 songs that he never played. But I don't know if that's gonna happen at this point. Yeah, we'll see. Um, that'd be cool. I would definitely be down for that. <laughs> be on the lookout for that for sure. So did you know that Andrew wrote the song when he was 18? Yes. Yeah. I was. I, I found that there's a really old acoustic kind of him and the piano version of this song on YouTube that I found. It kind of blew my mind because I have a, a nephew that age now, and I was like, "That's he's Ethan's age." <laughs> it kind of just blew my mind. Writing these prolific songs that thousands of people adore. Yeah, it's it is pretty amazing that an 18 year old pulled that off. He said he wrote it, and he talked about this in the live stream. He said he wrote it right after something corporate signed on for that record deal. 
And at the time, he and his friends and his sister Katie were all hanging out a lot. And it was a really exciting time for them because they just didn't know what was going to happen with, with the record they were going to release, if they'd have success or not. And there was this other girl named Kelly Hanch right. that would be hanging out with them sometimes too. She was a friend of, uh, of Katie's, his sister. And Andrew was interested in asking Kelly out, but he was nervous. She just viewed him as uh, her friend's brother. So he was a little hesitant. But apparently the first time he ever played the song for somebody was over the phone to Kelly's sister. And he was hoping that she would tell Kelly, and Kelly would be impressed, that, hey, Andrew wrote this song for you, about you and for you. So it took some convincing, he said, but eventually she came around and dated him. So Walking By was actually the first song that Andrew ever wrote for Kelly. And as we know, he's written several more by this point, you know, nowadays. But Yeah, I so uh, I went kind of digging through different live versions of this song to hopefully mm-hmm. find, and interviews, but I was trying to find anything I could. And I didn't find your version of that story, but I found a live video from the 2010 something corporate reunion where he actually tells kind of that same story i actually have it written here oh cool i'd love to hear it i will go ahead and read that he said um in introduction to the song and i quote in the middle of making this record i met this lady and i was really uh, i was trying to hook up with her was kind of the deal <laughs> but she wasn't interested at first and i called these guys you know waving to the band we had pretty much finished the EP at that point, and we had a couple days to finish it. And I was like, you guys, uh, I've written this really cool song, and I really need to get this chick. Will you please help me get it on the record? <laughs> That's hilarious. And being the hopeless romantics they are, they helped me in my quest. And later I ended up marrying that girl. Oh, so the first time she heard it allegedly was on the CD, and that was that was him impressing her. Yeah, I mean, I would be impressed. <laughs> yeah, I would too. That's, that's pretty, wow. So that's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I did not find that one. Yeah, I, I had to do some digging, which is kind of fun. Like, you know. Mm-hmm. It is. But it kind of makes it interesting because, especially with his older songs, where the internet wasn't what it is today. And it kind of is, mm-hmm. it's almost like a throwback to like back in the day where you didn't know everything about your favorite artists and you didn't know what all the songs were about. And it was kind of left some things up to the imagination. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of a, that's kind of a, a still a thing with, um, with him and with some of these older songs, uh, especially I, I kind of had to get to go digging and do some research, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, there isn't a lot out there about the older songs, you're right. And I wonder what I'm going to come up with when I start digging more into these other songs. So I'm really glad you suggested this song because it really gave me a chance to go way back. And that's and I was kind of looking forward to that. Until I found that story, the only thing I really had to go off of was this YouTube comment that I saw a long time ago of somebody in one of the videos on YouTube that said uh, I, that they met Andrew and told him they liked this song, and that Andrew said, thank you, it helped me get my misses. <laughs> so for a long time, I, I, I knew that he, he that's part of him wooing Kelly, but I didn't have the details. Well, your story helps me understand what I want to talk about next, and that's the sound of the song. It's so different than anything else that was on that EP. But now I see, from what you said, they had five songs laid down on the EP, recorded, ready to go. And he came in with the sixth one. He was like, I got to record this song. And it's like we talked about, just piano and strings and so different from all the other stuff on there. You know, I just kind of snuck that ballad in on the end there. I do love how raw the song sounds. Right. It, it works really well. I mean, it obviously sounds amazing with the full band and the strings. But it also, like so many of his other songs, it works well on this basic stripped down him the piano level as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, part of what I was thinking about what I hear in this song by way of like inspiration or some of his later work. And it's, you know, it's cut from the same cloth as some of those artists of the 90s that inspired him, such as Counting Crows, Ben Folds, Jimmy Eat World, you know, some of those some of those cool bands of the 90s who could write some really emotional music. Um, And I can definitely hear them in this song. And also kind of sounds a little bit like uh, his later song with Jack's Mannequin, Hammers and Strings. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I can hear a little bit of that, too. You know, the the songs I found to compare it to were, um, you mentioned Constantine earlier, and I definitely hear that. And I also think Globes and Maps. That's the only, Globes and Maps is the only 
song on one of their two proper albums that is only piano and strings, I noticed. And what's interesting about all three of those songs, so Globes and Maps, Constantine, and Walking By, is all three of them are album enders. Constantine ended Ready Break, Walking By ended Audio Boxer, and Globes and Maps ended Leaving Through the Window. So I listened to the last track on North, and although it's somewhat of a ballad, there's definitely, a, it's a full band. You got the electric guitars in there as well. So I was kind of hoping when I started listening, I was like, wait, is there is there no guitar on this one either? So North ended a little differently than the others. But the, the sound of the song in general, like I said, when I was downloading all those tracks on you know Morpheus or Audio Galaxy back in 2002, I was coming up with a lot of these light acoustic ballads. And so this song reminds me of that time in my life, you know, like, whereas he doesn't make too much music nowadays that's just him and a piano and strings, so. Yeah, I feel like even though a lot of his later music, you don't really hear that in the studio. You don't really hear those, like, bare bones, him and a piano type songs as much in a studio setting. There's plenty of, like, live performances and like sessions on YouTube where it is just like him and a piano and a guitar and it's it's just cool to see that his his songs are good enough to work on that level. Yeah. You know, even some of his popular sounding stuff that's really synthy, he can bring it back to the piano and, and have it be like almost better that way. <laughs> I appreciate those most when he it's just Andrew and a piano those songs that weren't previously stripped down that that do become that way. But additionally, sometimes I think about songs like like uh, Walking By and I'm like, what would that sound with the full band with electric guitars, you know, would it would it add anything to it? I I don't know the answer to that, but we we got the answer to that on another song called Wait because Wait was another one of those early tracks that was uh, just him and an acoustic guitar and then they recorded as a full band in 2010, which I love that song. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh... That's another underrated one that you don't hear a lot. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on, on the lyrics of this song? Yeah. So it's interesting. With lyrics, I, I think I think what people should understand about song lyrics is sometimes, sometimes they have different purposes. Uh, like sometimes a song tells a story. Um, sometimes song lyrics are more of a puzzle to be figured out. Sometimes they're just meant to be enjoyed, mm-hmm. almost like an abstract painting. I feel like a lot of Andrew's lyrics are ambiguous and mysterious sometimes there's more of a clear message sometimes there isn't um and sometimes he has sort of like this almost like this bob dylan thing where it's like what's this about you know Mm -hmm. yeah and so it's a treat when you when you hear an artist like that talk about what the song is about but also even when you're not sure you can still have like a lyric that sounds that just kind of sticks with you for some reason i i lived in michigan for a couple years I don't think I really had seasonal depression quite, but it did have an effect on me. And it's crazy how you can miss the sun. Like, you can miss seeing the sky so much. (laughs) Like, you don't know how important that is until, like, you don't have it. And I'm sure in in Ohio, maybe you can relate. I can definitely relate to that. In fact, uh, another thing we have in common is that I lived in Michigan for part of my life as well. Actually, the majority of it. I, I grew up in Michigan. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, so when I was in Michigan, I kept thinking of that lyric on that one sunny day that winter gave up. Because sometimes in the dead of winter, there would be this one glorious day where it was sunny or where it was kind of warm. Yeah. Or you see like a patch of blue sky and you're like, it's the sky. The sky's blue. <laughs> and you're yeah. just so happy. So, you know, just little things like that that just stick with you is is always fun. Yeah, that's a cool one. I really like the story he tells in the in the verses, too. And he says lines in the first verse like, Your granddad left home for the circus. He married a girl in Virginia. And then later on, your mother was born in December. It's like he's telling the history of her life through these lyrics. So in the, but then the second verse goes into these lines. She was raised in a New England village kind of like picking up where the first verse left off. Yeah. Then she moved to L.A. with her firefly stare, and you loved Sunset Strip when it sparkled. You grew up and you sparkled, but why don't you care? So it transitions in the second verse from, like, talking about her family. Is the you Kelly? I always imagine it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think it's Kelly. I, I was curious because it went, you know, from she was raised, she moved to L.A., but it's you love the sunset strip you grew up you sparkled why don't you care so it's an interesting pivot within that verse to me 
It's also odd to me. I, I think maybe this is the time to bring this up. It's also odd to me that he wrote the song before for Kelly before they started dating because doesn't it have the lyrics of a breakup song to you? Yeah, I was just gonna say that. I I used <laughs> okay. to think I used not just to me think then. This was a breakup song, and you know, yeah. especially with the line, "What did I do that you don't seem to want me? Where can I go that your pictures won't haunt me?" <laughs> and uh, yeah, right. And that's how the song ends. That's like the crescendo of the song. There, I guess maybe her not being interested at first could have, could be interpreted as like a mini breakup. Okay, so maybe rejection. Yeah, I maybe guess that, so, that yeah. that's how he expressed the feeling of rejection he was getting from her. Right. Another lyric that's you know I sort of you know how sometimes you sort of have your own meanings to lyrics. Oh yeah, I I definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like throughout your younger years or your twenties. You have like all these people in your life that are in your life for like a short period of time, or you do like this mm-hmm. odd job for a few months, or you have this class for a few months. You know these people for short periods of time, and and it makes me think of the lyrics. Um, why do you leave these stories unfinished? And because you know we go through life, and there's a lot of stories that are unfinished. <laughs> it's just kind of how it is. Yeah, that's a cool line. Um, in at the end of the song, did you notice that the chorus changes? So it goes from, so why do you leave these stories unfinished to, so why do you leave these questions unanswered? Right. Yeah, I, I like that change up there. The The next line, my Cheshire cat doorstop with tears in her eyes becomes my Cheshire cat doorstop with fear in your smile. And then why do you look when you've already found it becomes, and what did I do that you don't seem to want me? And lastly, what did you find that could leave you walking by becomes, what makes it so easy for you to be walking by. See, that last line, what makes it so easy for you to be walking by, makes the most sense in the context of him feeling, maybe feeling rejected by her and, and wanting her, but maybe she's not showing the interest. So, and I suppose maybe that's what walking by, you know, that is a symbol for that. Like she's, she sees him, but she's going to keep walking by. Yeah. Like what makes it so easy for you to just not, want to be with me <laughs> is, yeah. is what I the sense that I that I'm getting from that yeah the chorus definitely has the heaviest lyrics in terms of emotion to me I don't know what you think yeah I mean that's that that question of like of why you know like why are these why are these questions unanswered why are these stories unfinished mm-hmm. you know it's like it's like this this message to her that he he wants he wants answers yeah. He wants some more communication there, is I guess my assumption. And then there's the the alternate, which is the bridge in the song. He says, these nights I get high just from breathing. Well, I lie here with you, I'm sure that I'm real, like that firework over the freeway. I could stay here all day. So that all sounds pretty positive. And then, and then the last part, but that's not how you feel. You know, that firework lines are kind of interesting because I remember when I was a kid, we would go and watch the fireworks on the 4th of July. And then we w- uh-huh. like, stared at fireworks for so long that on the drive home, we would see like an airplane or a street lamp. Like your brain tricks you and makes you think you're seeing a firework. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that has anything to do with <laughs> that lyric or the meaning behind it, but I always, that's what I think of with that lyric. Yeah. And I think Andrew would be cool with that. Like, hey, what does, I don't know, what does it mean to you? Kind of depending on the song, what he might say. And I like that. I like that sort of mystery. I like a little mystery. I, I like a little ambiguity. And uh, you know, I, I don't know if I want every song explained in that much detail. I, I mean, I want to know as a fan, but sometimes it's fun mm-hmm. to not know. Yeah, and and sometimes if you know, then you're disappointed in what it's actually about, right? Because now it's it kind of takes away the interpretation that you've made for for the song. If I was like, this breakup song got me through the worst month of my life. And then he's like, oh, actually, it's like how I got my my person, my wife. And yeah. like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Do you have a favorite part of the song or a favorite line of the song? I, You know, I, I think just musically, I, I think that I love when strings are used in a, in a song like this. When rock music has strings in it, it's really fun. And it doesn't have to be a ballad either. You know, he's not afraid to write these like brutally honest and and emotional sad lyrics that maybe a lesser artist would be afraid like oh i don't know is this cheesy will you know will people will people laugh at this for being so earnest mm-hmm. he's brave in that way 
and he's been said as the guy who brought keyboards to Warp Tour. You mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of really visceral rock in that time, which I love, but but to have that kind of range that he has, to be able to, to rock out and go slow, sometimes even in the same song, is just awesome. It's magnificent. <laughs> yeah, they were they were definitely a unique standout when I saw them in 2002 uh, Warp Tour. And they were perfectly accepted when I, by the time I saw them in 2008 as Jack, when I saw him as Jack's mannequin. Yeah, it was kind of a, you know, walking by, I was like, this guy's jumping on a piano up there. And I only caught a few of those songs. I actually didn't watch the whole thing because I didn't know who they were before I saw them that day. So question, um, a friend of mine who was around for the Something Corporate days told me that he once lit his piano on fire. Have you, have you ever witnessed that? No, I haven't. But um, let's see. The only two times I saw something corporate, one was at the Warp Tour, where they had, you know, ex- as you know, they have exactly 30 minutes to play, you know, six or whatever songs. And then the other time was at an indoor venue. So I don't think that would have gone well. <laughs> right. But I, I, I've i never heard that before. That's crazy. I. It must not have happened very often, but I guess it happened that, that one time. <laughs> but, you yeah. know. I'll just let it be legend. I've seen him jump on the keys and then jump and then dive off the piano onto the stage. Oh yeah, for sure, all the time. Yeah, I mean that's kind of that's kind of standard of his, but yeah, gotta love that. Like the uh, you know the grunge guys of the '90s would smash their guitars. Andrew would bang on his piano and then jump on his piano and then jump off. I almost feel like that's a statement. Like, oh, you don't think pianos are 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 rock and roll? Yeah, I'll show you. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and he and he took a cue that cue from some of his idols like Billy Joel and Elton John, you know, like oh yeah, two uh, two of the greatest known uh, pianists in modern music history. So we talked earlier about the fact that you can find uh, "Walking By" performed on the live at the Ventura show on YouTube. So that's from two thousand four. That's out there. Uh, it is played a bit faster than the original recording, and then I. Also found, I think, the same live version you did, it sounds like, from the AOL sessions in 2002. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, where it's just Andrew, he has his moppy hair, he's on, a, he's on a piano, and then you got the drummer and the bassist in the background. Right, yeah. I felt like that version was so much more intimate than the, uh, the Live of the Ventura one. I don't know if it was just the fact that they were playing in this small room compared to a huge concert venue, but... I really yeah. like that version a lot, and I, was, I, I felt like that was like a, a treasure to find, to be honest. That's probably it. I'll link both of those live versions that we found on the show notes there. I'd also recommend the uh, Instagram live version from last year. That was that was pretty awesome as well. Absolutely. So some final thoughts here. Um, it's clearly a special song to Andrew and Kelly, and being how personal Andrew's music usually is, that pretty much makes it a special song to the fans as well. Jake, where does this song rate for you? Yeah, so as far as something corporate songs go, it's probably in the top two or three. Ruthless might be my favorite something corporate song, but I I put it in the same sort of category as Hammers and Strings, Constantine, yeah, which are Hammers and Strings is obviously a Jack's Mannequin song. But yeah, it's definitely up there. That's kind of how I would put it, too. It's like, if I put all his ballads into the same category, I would say that that's near the top of the ballads for me. Yeah, it's up there for sure. It's something about it just kind of radi- radiates nostalgia. It's just so, like, romantic, you know? <laughs> you can just kind of feel it. Yeah, it's it's so real. It's raw. It's it's intimate. Uh, and I think that's that's what makes it so special. And the, the next thing I'm going to ask you is, uh, do you have any final thoughts? If you like somebody, maybe try to write them a song. It might work out for you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I tried it once. It didn't work out for me, but hey, you know, it might it might work out. If you can write a song as good as Andrew, it'll work. If you have skills to songwrite and play music, then uh, go for it. That's what I say. I'll tell you what, I've, I've dabbled in trying to write music, and it is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not easy yeah i don't play any instruments i, I don't even attempt it <laughs> well, it's amazing how simple of a song andrew mcmahon can write and that makes it look easy to write a song but if uh-huh. anything i feel like it's harder to make a song that just works on that basic of a level to where it's one guy and a piano but sounds like there's so much more happening than there is yeah that's how i feel about most of his music Well, thank you guys again for listening. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast so more people can find it. And post a comment on one of our socials. I'd love to hear your feedback. 
And if you'd like to message me directly, email somethinginthewilderness at gmail.com. Huge thank you to Jake for coming on the show and discussing this song with me. Thank you so much, Jake. Thank you. Yeah, where can we find you online, by the way? I am on Instagram uh, at Jake's Mannequin, and um, I'm on Twitter at Jake0790. Cool. And then you said you were telling me that you have a podcast out there, right? Yes, I do. I haven't I haven't uploaded in a while, but I have a podcast called The Jet. It's uh, Jake's Entertainment Talk, and it's um, pretty much all things entertainment: uh, movies, music, movie news. It's very it's a pretty broad category there. But yeah, it's uh, it's called The Jet. You can find it on Spotify or Apple Music. Well, cool. I'll definitely be checking it out. And if if you ever reboot it and and want someone to uh, guest on it, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I I might just I might just take you up on that. Also, another podcast I want to plug is uh, my my older brother Adam has him and his friend Mike have a podcast about the '90s, uh, about mostly '90s music and '90s rock and uh, all things '90s called "1990 What," and you can find that pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast. Well, I'll definitely be checking that out too because I I love my '90s music and that's for me that's kind of where the passion started for music. So. Well, again, thanks, Jake, for coming. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed discussing this song with you. You definitely have a passion for discussing music, and I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Anytime. (laughs) We'll see you next time. 